Hello. Today, we'll be looking at the 10th in the series called Linguistics Short Introductions, a series I began uh, more than a year ago uh, when we had the first lockdown. I was under the impression that I had done this particular video also, which was meant to be the last of the series, in the series. But uh, now I realize that it was not, and I thought I'll do it now. And this 10th um, episode is called Morphemes and Allomorphs which come under the category morphology. Uh, morphology is the study of words, whereas uh, phonology, in we look at the sounds of English. Uh, phonology, morphology, etc. are words we could use with any language, but uh, here we are interested in the morphology of English language. So in morphology, we look at the words, how words are formed, and how words change perhaps when we utter them, etc. So morphology is an interesting and very important area of linguistics. Let's look at it now. Yes, so we are looking at morphology. Morphology is the study of words and their structure. How words are structured is studied by morphology. Words, how do you define words? You know, you to, to define words in a very linguistic, using linguistic terminology, would be words are meaningful linguistic units that can be combined to form phrases and sentences. And how are these words formed? To know that we break words into its different parts and morphology does it for us. Morphology breaks words into parts like stems, prefixes and suffixes and studies them. And now what are these stems, prefixes, and suffixes? To look at parts of a word, let's take a word unacceptable as an example. Unacceptable or able. Unacceptable. Un comes before the main part of the word. The main part of the word which contains meaning is called the stem or root of the word. Some words will have only the root or the stem. For example, accept itself is a word. So we say it has only the stem or root uh, or the base form. There are three words which we can use. And this base form or the stem of the uh, word can have a prefix, something that happens before, and a suffix that is added after. So that takes us to the, the word morpheme. So what is a morpheme? A morpheme is a meaningful unit that cannot be further divided. So when we work on words and divide words, we reach basic units of the words themselves. And these basic units are called morphemes. So we saw that the word unacceptable has three parts. Un, accept, ABLE. Un is a prefix, ABLE is the suffix, and accept is the root word. So we know an able, able, which is an independent word, an independent stem, which is not a suffix. Don't confuse able, the suffix, with able, the word. Okay, that's a different thing. So in unacceptable, the word, we say that un is a morpheme, accept is a morpheme, and able is a morpheme. Able or able, however you'd like to call it. So there are three morphemes. So what is a morpheme? Morpheme is the, the basic part of a word. You cannot divide it further. When you, if you break un, then you get two sounds, a uh, and n. So that is it. Mo a morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit. This is similar to a phoneme. A phoneme is the basic sound unit. We cannot break it further. There can be two kinds of morphemes, free morpheme and bound morpheme. So in the, in the word we saw unacceptable, accept would be the free morpheme and un and able would be bound morphemes. So look at another example, friendly, friend and you have the suffix li which is bound because friend can stand independently and ly is a slave, it is not free, it is always bound to something else. 
therefore we call it, it a bound morpheme to go back to look at our example here um, un and able are bound morphemes because they cannot stand independently if they stand independently they won't have any particular meaning so accept is the free morpheme in this in uh, in this word there are three morphemes and of that accept is the free morpheme while un and able are bound morphemes so look at this table here studied has study plus ed ed is the past tense uh, morpheme it is bound untidy so un showing the negative significance you have we add that as a prefix to tidy tidy is free un is bound noble in nobility noble is free lity the suffix is bound fairness now it's easy for you you can guess that fair is free and nis is the bound morpheme enliven so we have in enliven you have en acting as a suffix and a prefix en live en so you have en the, the prefix and en the suffix being bound morphemes and live as the free morpheme We have been talking uh, a lot about suffixes and prefixes and I have a feeling that there may be need for a little more clarification. The adding of suffixes and prefixes is called affixation. So you see that affixation. What is affixation? Affixation is attaching bound morphemes to free morphemes. We have seen free and bound morphemes. So the process of adding prefixes and suffixes um, is called affixation. Fixing something to the stem root or base is called affixation. You, ha you can have prefixes, you can have suffixes. Here in the prefix category in, flame, be, friend, disinfect. And here you have suffixes, common suffixes like friendship, ship, picturesque, um, you have Romanesque, brotherhood, see this hood is a common suffix. Now you have an idea of what prefixing and suffixing are and both of them are called affixes. And there is a possibility of having infixes also. Actually in English there aren't uh, proper infixes, but for the sake of argument you can say there are infixes as well. Infixes are morphemes inserted within a stem to produce a new word. For example, you have cupful. Uh, to show plural, you add an S and say cups full. You are adding it inside the word. See, actually, it is between the um, uh, the stem and the suffix. Spoons full, passes by, can be said to be examples of infixes, though it wouldn't be very precise to say that. And then another uh, in in speech, particularly native speech, people. To, to use um, in, uh, in a, on a lighter vein and to be a bit abusive, people sometimes use infixes, which again are not quite infixes because it's one word being inserted within another word. For example, you know, fantastic. And if you add the word freaking in between, it becomes fan freaking -tastic. And absolutely. So you can see how it works. Absolutely. And in... in in speech, when people speak in a light-hearted way in some parts of English, native English-speaking countries, they say absa bloody lutely And you can have absa freaking lutely if you want. And fan bloody tastic. And, you know, in, 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 in Australia, kangaroos are sometimes a bit of a nuisance. And they would call it a kanga bloody roo. This bloody is inserted within kangaroo. So these can be considered to be infect, infixes. I've just put this here so that you know that there is a possibility of having infixes, though uh, it's not there in English in a big uh, way. So that is, we have looked at affixation, prefixing, suffixing, which are very common, which are very crucial to English uh, in, in its morphological uh, functioning. And you can also have infixes technically. Then we might want to know what affixes do. Affixes in language, like prefixes, suffixes, uh, are used for mainly two purposes. One 
is for derivation and other is for inflection. Now what is derivation and what is inflection? We look at derivation first. Derivation, the word derivation comes from derive. Okay? So derivational affixes are added to morphemes to derive or form new words. So you want to get a new word from an existing word, you add an inflection. A good example is derivation itself. Derive, derivation. Derive is a verb and derivation, the addition of shin, is to create a noun out of the verb derive. So this is the process of derivation. You derive a new part of speech from an existing one. For example, um, the words like full, beautiful. Beauty, beauty is a noun and to make an adjective, we add full, beautiful and bearable, imbalance, nationhood, unclear, malfunction, metaphysics, mistake, surpass. See, here when we add these affixes, some of them are prefixes and some are suffixes, we get a new word from an existing word. So this, the, the word we get through derivation is an independent word, though it is derived from the former word. They are independent. For example, beauty and beautiful are totally independent words. So that is derivation. While inflection, on the other hand, are different. In English, we, we add suffixes a lot to show grammatical change, like ing, like ed, I am walking, walk, walking, walking, the addition of ing, we do not get a new word, but you get another form of the word walk. So all English prefixes are derivational. We add prefixes only for derivation, but suffixes can be both derivation and inflection. Now, what is inflection? Inflectional affixes or you add an affix to a word to show grammatical changes like walk walking, walked ed, you added ed to show the past form, see it is to show grammatical changes. The word we get that way, walked or walking, are not new words, they are only forms of the word walk. So no new words are formed by ad the addition of inflectional affixes. And remember, sometimes the, the same affix can be used for inflection and for um, derivation. That is possible. And suffixes can create both new words and serve grammatical purposes. It means, uh, in English, prefixes are all derivational. We don't add a prefix uh, for grammatical reason, for inflections, but uh, suffixes can be both um, used for derivation and for grammatical purposes. That is inflection and let's look at inflection a little more. In English, uh, we have basically the, uh, these eight forms to show grammatical changes. Uh, look at the word wait. She waits. Because they, it would be wait. She or he waits. So this S is added to show third person singular present tense. ED to show the past tense. He walked. ING to get the continuous feeling, watching or walking or waiting. EN, past participle, she has eaten. In some words, we get the past participle by the addition of EN and that is the purpose of the EN suffix in terms of inflection. YES for plural form or ES is also for plural form and apostrophe S for possessive. And ER for the comparative form, taller, sharper, faster. EST to show the superlative form, tallest, sharpest. Okay, so th this is inflection. These suffixes are called inflectional suffixes. And some of them can be used for derivation as well. Let's not think of that right now. But here, these are the eight inflections, inflectional suffixes in English. So inflection means change in a word to show a grammatical uh, purpose 
and not to get a new word. When you get a new word, it is derivation. For example, E-A-T, eat, and you add an E-R, eta, to get a new word. That is a different thing. Eat, eater, one who eats is an eater. That's a different word. So the same uh, suffix that we used to get a comparative form has been used in eater to get a derivation. We are familiar with phonemes and allophones. We say that a, phone, a phoneme could have several allophones. Uh, in morphology, we look at allomorphs, morphemes and allomorphs. Allomorphs uh, are uh, slightly variant forms within a morpheme, which uh, are realized when we pronounce them, only when we articulate them. So it's related to phonology. So we, we call it generally morphophonemics. Yes, allomorphs are variant phonetic forms of a morpheme. What does that mean? We know we have heard of allophones, which are slightly variant forms of a phoneme. A morpheme, when we pronounce it, could have slight differences in different contexts. Let's look at that. Here, look at this side, to the left side, plural suffix s or es. To get a plural form of a word, in English, we usually and usually we add s or es. For example, cap is uh, the, we add s and make it caps, and bus bus we add es to get buses. Now, how do th these are all s s same so sound s, but it is realized in speech differently. For example, caps is caps. Okay, beds is beds. The same S addition. In pronunciation, it is realized differently. Here it is caps and here it's beds. It's a, z, a voiced sound has come. And in buses, it, is, it becomes is, is. So the same plural suffix represented by the letter S is realized in three different ways. S, z and is. These differences are allomorphic differences. We say that the morpheme S or ES has three different allomorphs. So this allomorph uh, are related to phonetics also. It, it comes only in pronunciation uh, in, in this case. So S, Z and IS are the allomorphs of the plural suffix S, which is a morpheme, a bound morpheme, if you remember. In past tense also we have this feature. De, usually we add de or ed to a word to get the past tense in English. So fished, begged, batted, ed in all these cases. And it can be d sometimes. They are morphologically they look the same. But in pronunciation, you get allomorphs. For example, fished, it is not fished, it's fished. And begged, it's begged, begged, not begged, but begged. And it is batted, batted, fished, begged, and batted. So here it is realized as t, here d, and here id. So the past tense morpheme d or id has three different realizations. There are three allomorphs, t, d, and id. Now, why does this happen? Uh, the, let me explain the logic as well. Here, what happens is um, the, the choice of allomorph uh, has a phonological base because here cap, per, happens to be a voiceless word, and so we use the voiceless s, caps. It's easier to say caps than saying caps. You, 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 you'll note that. And here in bed, you have d, which is a voiced sound. And naturally, we have a voiced form of the uh, morpheme here. It's beds. See, it's easier to say beds than to say beds. And here, bus. Bus ends with a s sound. And it is easier to add a is than z or s. So we say Bus is. Here also, fish, sh is a voiceless sound, so we had a voiceless t, fished. 
and beg g is a voice sound and we have begged it's easier to say begged than to say begged and here it's easier to say fished than to say fished batted so the, because this word ends in t it becomes id so if it if a, if a past tense word ends in um, i mean a word ends in t or d and you add the past tense ed it becomes id so id occurs when you have a t or a d ending and now let's look at uh, this sir in a little detail uh, the plural alum of is occurs see this is buses it occurs after sir z sh j ch and j these are called the sibilants in english in a general way we can call sir z sh j ch and j as sibilants so when a word ends in a sibilant the plural um, uh, suffix will be is the allomorphic variant of the morpheme would be is and this bus this is bus and this is buz z buzz bus buses buses flashes garages churches bridges so whenever you have a s z sh j ch or j at the end of a word and you have s or es after that it will be pronounced is buses buses flashes garages churches and bridges and hedges that is the allomorphic variant and uh, in uh, t uh, please remember after t and d it is always id and we look at what morphophonology is there is a word morphophonology you need to know what it is it is about the different phonemic shapes of an allophone of an allomorph um these allomorphic allomorphs of a of a morpheme can have different phonemic shapes which we have already seen s z and is t d and id are all different shapes phonemic shapes of allomorphs the occurrence of the plural and past tense allomorphs in english is conditioned by the final sounds of the nouns we say there is phonological conditioning involved here so morphophonemics because uh, we we use the word morphophonemics because there are occasions when within morphology some changes happen due to phonological reasons and uh, such cases are called we say that is phonologically conditioned so it is phonological conditioning all these choice of is id etc are phonologically decided or conditioned and different from phonological conditioning there can be morphological conditioning also at times in the choice of allomorphs so when the allomorphs are not decided by the last sound of the root word we say there is morphological conditioning uh, so children child children this is due to historic reasons we we do not say childs we say children so it's not morphologic uh, phonological conditioning here it is morphological conditioning child children ox oxen then those are addition of en and here you have the the word inside changing man changes to men it's these are examples for mutation uh, sit sat so in in all these cases the plural form is decided by the morphology by the word itself not because of the addition of a um, um, s so this is called morphological conditioning not because s is not there but because the change in the plural is not because of phonological reasons it due to historical alum um, morphological reasons and another um, case of morphological conditioning would be zero modification where there is no change at all for example sheep press uh, singular and plural both are sheep baggage is a word which doesn't have a separate plural we don't add s to any of these words deer furniture so here all here we have a plural and a singular but there is no change so we say there is a zero modification and see we say that there is a zero allomorph there so the, this is also an example of morphological conditioning that takes us to the final slide uh, we conclude our discussion on morphology 
with a little um, observation on content words and function words. Uh, English has, a, has, a, has several peculiarities as a language. One is that it doesn't have as much inflections as Indian languages have. Inflection is word ending. We, all, we now know that. So in, in a language like Malayalam, we have so many inflections that we can add to a noun or a verb. And noun, for example, uh, pustagam. We can have pustagam, pustagatinde, pustagatinoda, pustagatinagatta, pustagamai, pustagomai. So any number of um, forms that can be created by adding different suffixes to the word pustagam in Malayalam. But in English, we have only book and books. See? There, so all the purposes that are served by this inflection in a language like Malayalam has to be served in other ways in English. And that is why we have so many words like prepositions, articles, pronouns, auxiliary verbs, etc. in English. And prepositions, articles, pronouns and auxiliaries in English serve the purpose of inflection in a language like Malayalam or Hindi. So um, th that takes us to content words and function words. In English, there are two categories. The, the vocabulary of English, the, the words in English can be divided into two broad categories. Content words would be nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs. Words that carry meaning. We call that an open class. Nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs are all uh, content words. All the prepositions, articles, pronouns and auxiliary verbs are they are function words. They are, they are only for grammatical purposes. They don't have any particular independent existence. So this is something we need to know. This is important when we talk about um, sentence stress. When we speak uh, in sentences in English, we don't give equal importance to all words. And nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs often get the emphasis. While prepositions, articles, pronouns and art, uh, auxiliary verbs tend to be weakened, or sometimes they just disappear in continuous speech. Um, so content words are called open class because new word, new nouns, new verbs, new adjectives come into, into the language almost every day. But new pronouns, new uh, sorry, new prepositions, new articles, new auxiliary verbs, new pronouns do not come in. They are fixed. They, they are a fixed category uh, in in the vocabulary of English language. So this is something we need to keep in mind uh, when we look at morphology. Uh, thank you for listening to that video. Uh, hope to see you again soon. But I think I will conclude with this, uh, the series called Linguistics Short Introductions. So thank you and uh, take care of yourself.